at arms will restore order in the gallery. Hey, welcome to Scary Ideas episode 17. On this uh, special episode, my guest is the host of Friday Nights All Right, a new talk show on freespeech.tv. Please welcome the pop star of hate, <laughs> Milo Yiannopoulos. And here he is with you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, can I ask you, sir, or sorry, that's exactly what I was not supposed to do. What are your pronouns? Oh, uh, I, I don't have, yeah, just no, I'm normal man. Normal man. man. Normal man. He, him, and, and heroic. I'm just a regular person. <laughs> Thank you for letting us get that out of the way. This is a very <laughs> progressive, uh, city and community that we're in. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. And last night I watched most of the interview you had with uh, Nicholas Fontes. Fuentes. Fuentes. And well, that... you know, he's, 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 he has some uh, he has some some fans who are not uh, hugely enthusiastic about the uh, immigration over the southern border. So it's important to pronounce his name right. You know. Uh, oh yeah, that guy you like, Mr. Fuentes. Uh, you know? So yeah. He's, yeah. He's, there's all these new guy. like these new conservatives. They're getting younger and younger, and like they're more miniaturized versions of Ben Shapiro. Like he looks. No, like, they do keep getting shorter. Yeah. It's true. It's like they're in a little shrinking machine. What you know, is that I, about? When I was growing up, I always thought like there was that you were normal, and then when you got to forty, when you were married with children and you had investments, then you would become a Republican, right? <laughs> but now they're 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 these like little midgets. They pop out fully formed, already in a suit and a <laughs> polyester tie, you know, and they're ready to go. <laughs> and I guess I'm one of them. I'm like five two or something like that. And I'm really it's a sort of manlet republicanism. This manlet, is a new, I, that's I a should, good one. I should, I should write this. <laughs> so yeah, that dude I guess is also from my area. I'm from the uh, suburbs of Chicago as well, and I've I've never heard of this guy. I guess like he's becoming a rising. Uh, I wouldn't say star because it's hard to be. A, you're a star, you're the pop star of hate, but you earned that. That's what they say. That's what they say. That lib I think it was Liberation, which is the France's Washington Post. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's not self-ascribed. You just kind of... Uh, well, you get to a certain stage in your career and you don't need to make up names for yourself because there are so many of them out there to choose from, you know? <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. Well, I like it, though. It sounds cool. And um, so that dude is just a pretty... Like, he has a comedy show, but obviously he's... I don't think he's ever done stand-up. No, he's not a comedian as you guys would understand it. Yeah, he would, dude. He would probably not be very well uh, accepted. Like compared to him, I'm like a l lefty. Right. But like, it depends on the crowd. I mean, he's very popular, and I think you would find if he yeah, went he on, if he did a university college campus, I think he'd pack the house. I think they'd love it uh, if he were to do stand up. But he's he's got aspirations to seriousness. Um, right. So I think think he's he wants to he wants to be a serious dude. Did Although you? He is very funny. I, some of the things he says are right reprehensible, but he's very charismatic and very likable. Did you start off as a serious dude? No. No, 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 no. I, I mean, uh, people wanted me to be, and my first job was at the Telegraph, which is a very fancy posh newspaper in London, and they, and I worked also for the Catholic Herald, which is a very uptight, well, not uptight, it was just a very serious publication, you know, no cussing, no trolling, no, none of this. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm very hungover. Yeah, you look like you had fun last night. No, I was on um, your uh, Telegram channel, and uh, you yeah, I've got yesterday's makeup on still because I did it from the studio. I didn't even I didn't even bother to clean myself up when I got home. I just passed out. So yeah, sorry for the state I'm in. Um, I mean, uh, you look great compared to me. I'm a disheveled, pale comedian who does. I need a haircut very badly right now. But it's your thing, you comedians. You like to kind of shuffle on and be self-deprecating and all the rest of it. I just look like Courtney Love right now, which is not <laughs> that I was going to go for today. Um, uh, no, anyway. Um, what did you ask me? Some about being serious. Like you started oh, off. Yes. So no, I, I, I. The people tried to make me serious, and then I just kept like 
pushing and pushing and nudging and pushing um and and people would just say well you can't write that you can't say that you can't write that and i would just kind of slide things under the radar get jokes in um and get in trouble for them so that <laughs> i used to invent these things about people in my report and it was very serious print reporting for a very serious mm -hmm. newspaper so i would make stuff up so i was on the t i was writing about technology i was on the tech beat and i i made uh, i had a little social run-in with um uh, a guy who founded a, a company called TweetDeck, which at the time was like a really complicated Twitter client that you could use. And you had all these columns, you know, and so it was full of kind of like power users of Twitter. And he was really, really fat. His name was Ian Dodsworth, and he was really fat. And I just invented that he's a, he was a former champion figure skater. Um, and I just I put, so I put Ian Dodsworth, CEO of TweetDeck, comma, former champion figure skater, comma. And I never expected that it would make it into print. I thought someone would catch it and take it out, and they didn't. And this kind of emboldened me. Uh, so I, the next thing I did was um, the uh, the CEO of Spotify, who I'd written a, I'd written a, a disobliging column about Spotify, uh, saying no one's no artist is ever going to get paid from this, and from the point of view of a creator, like I'm not seeing it. And so he like you know tweeted it whatever. So next time I was on Sky News, which is like our kind of like our Fox, uh, and someone asked me about this. So Daniel Eck and I said, oh actually it's pronounced Eek. Um, and I just kind of made up that his name was really pronounced Eek. And now he, to, to this day, he keeps getting introduced as Daniel Eek uh, <laughs> at press conferences and stuff. So I was low level negging and trolling and just fucking with people. And, and, and it just really, I had much more fun doing that than my actual job. And so I eventually had to become something else. Did he um, get, did he uh, ban you from Spotify for that or? Do you know it's funny? I think it's the only thing I'm not banned from. Yeah, it's I impossible. The only, thing I'm, it's the only thing that I'm still allowed to use. It's brilliant. Um, I mean, yeah. So you started off as a writer, and then I mean, you were never. You said you were, but now you're. You've evolved after this post cancellation. Ver, I'm trying to use big words, but I'm not going to use big words. Let's just okay. say you got canceled. What you got? What's your mug? My mug is the Crowder, louder oh, with Crowder. No. Oh, oh no! Oh. oh come on! You yeah. you instinctively know to be ashamed of it because you're holding it in such a manner that yep. the camera can't read it. Totally. You you know it's wrong. So, you, <laughs> what do you think of like Crowder fans? Are they like too soft for you? Um, no. His listeners, I quite like. It's just a show that's bad. Um, uh, <laughs> haven't you been on it a lot? I used to do it a lot more than oh. than. I mean, I wouldn't get an invitation these days because you got to understand that when all of the interesting and fun people were kind of ejected, so that's like Roger Stone, mm -hmm. uh, Gavin McGuinness, me, Laura Loomer, Alex Jones, you know, we're all a bit bonkers, but none of us is a bigot. We're not hateful. We're not racist. We're just a bit mental, but also very effective. We're very good at persuading and converting people. When we were all banned, the safe people saw an opportunity to kind of uh, for a land grab, you know, for a consolidation of power. So they went even safer in their shows and e took even fewer risks. And now you have like the Shap Shapiro crowd. Of, they don't take any risks. They don't take any scalps. They just kind of, you know, like chat the same tired, repetitive old shit all day, every day. And they've been doing right. this, you know, they're, they're sort of recycling their best hits from, from a decade ago. now. so I just find it boring. I yeah, it makes sense. I mean, they're trying not, I guess they're trying to stay on the mainstream platform. They just and... desperately want to not get banned from things because they don't have anything else. Whereas those of us who did get banned, I think, I think we were pushing the boat out because we had something to go home to, if that makes sense. Um, so it was, you know, you, you, it's difficult to explain. I mean, you have like a bedrock at home, you have something, you know, kind of real. I think that you don't put quite so much pressure on your career and you don't panic you, you I, it, it makes you a little bit less risk averse in a way because you sort of don't take it quite seriously and you and you it's not all you have right so i think those of us who have like real fans like roger and, and alex and me you know we have like and we had careers before we all like own our own houses like you mm -hmm. know and, and all that kind of stuff um i think maybe we just didn't we, we we're not so desperately clinging to fame and wealth both we've all had horrible crashes in both of those things but we're all still happy and i think those guys really i don't know how they would get up in the morning if they didn't have it so it's okay i mean it's just a personality thing it's fine but they've retreated into such a safe way of speaking that i i can't watch them anymore i just find it too dull oh, okay yeah that's interesting <laughs> i mean you're including alex no alex jones is one of the Dangerous. No, Alex. Alex is delightfully bonkers, bonkers. Um, and, a, and a good friend of mine. And he's completely crazy. And but he's a he's he's a 
dear friend of mine and turns out to be right about everything i have to say. <laughs> like, the, okay maybe not sandy hook but maybe not um, that but, maybe not the frog thing the gay no, frog no, 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 the frogs is real that's real um, it's a story in the, in the in the daily mail and i took it all the way to the original sources about how chemicals in the water from um uh gov- from, from factories that make have contracts with the government all the rest of it was turning um, amphibians uh, uh, asexual and hermaphroditic in the rivers. They wow. were turning the frogs gay. It's wow. real. It actually happened. It's true. Alex Jones was right. And I found myself over the I found myself over the last couple of years. I just go, oh, not again, not again. Like it keeps being right. Yeah. So I mean, I guess to focus on the whole post cancellation thing, like Alex Jones, like he kind of started his own website from the from the beginning. So right, he being... owns their own shop or much right. more well insulated. And like you, on Facebook, you're you're screwed. But but if absolutely, you're... how does it feel to be back to be on Facebook right now? By the way, well, I'm only on Skype. I don't have True. to go on Facebook. You you're know? just would, a little I... window. But, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it if you made me go on Facebook.com. Uh, but <laughs> I mean, you know, I've got. I've got my pride. <laughs> but but, yep. you know, but I, I, I am. I'm fine. I'm. I'm happy to talk to you on Skype. Hell yeah, dude. That's I good. Lose the channel for this, by the way. This will be a turning point for for me for sure. But I'm recording it locally, so it'll not go anywhere, even if it does get removed or anything. But so far, all we talked about was the frogs being gay. So this is but a. But they are turning the frogs gay. So far, this is a left, you know, this is leftist appropriate. We haven't even scratched the surface at all. No, but my mere existence is the is exactly is, uh, is enough. You, we, mm-hmm. we we could we could sit here uh, seeing the praises of Black Lives Matter, and and that would be that would, would still exactly. not, it would still not cut the mustard. As you know, but so like I was saying, like Alex Jones, like he got banned from YouTube, I don't know, a couple of months ago, but it didn't really affect his base because he's central on uh, his central places. And for wars, I think it's a website, just how you got annexed from all the mainstream platforms. So you just kind of, you didn't start free speech TV, but you got hired on well, Ga- Gavin and I are doing it Gavin. together. Uh, so he started on his own and then I, I kind of joined the family. So uh, we're doing it together now. And, uh, uh, I mean, it's, he's he's the boss there, but I right. have my own show and I can you know do what I want and all the rest of it. So yeah, no, it's it's. I think in the eighties and nineties, when uh, people who were outside the politically correct, uh, you know, mainstream core, uh, and especially conservatives, realized that TV wasn't for them and they weren't going to be able to survive on television, they retreated to talk radio. Right. So this is this is when you get the uh, you know the Rush Limbaugh's and the Michael Savages uh, building audiences of millions on. AM radio on talk radio. Now liberals don't even know where to find talk radio. If you you know if you if you if you went into Portland and said, uh, do you know how to how to listen to Rush Limbaugh? They wouldn't even know what device you needed. It's like, can you just download your phone? I don't even know. Do you need to buy a radio? They don't know how to tune into talk radio. Mm-hmm. So it's quite well insulated from mobs and from uh, out the outrage brigade, you know. Whereas um, I think. For the video era, those of us who want to be on screen, we're just going to have to build our own websites. We're going to have to just uh, build out our own platforms completely, use email and text marketing, and uh, and and just realize that social media is not for us. Got it. Um, yeah, we got a bunch of people watching. So somebody said, what is he selling now? It's like, I don't know, his show? Oh, what am I selling now? <laughs> I don't know. You're pretty fu- for someone who's supposedly worth negative two million dollars. You seem pretty chipper. Uh, yeah, because it's not true. <laughs> like, like everything else you read about me, it isn't true. Right. Uh, I, one of my businesses is in, is in trouble. One of the smaller ones, uh, and is in debt for a couple of million. But it's not personal debt. I mean, I'm I'm doing okay. But thank you for the concern. I, I appreciate your your listener uh, asking. Uh, you know how in a, in a way. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, probably a lot of people, I don't know, it's too much to care about, like, I don't know, a lot of people, it's, I don't care about what the chat says, I'm just going to read what I wanted to ask you, so anyway. That's probably better. <laughs> so Telegram is, is one of the platforms that a lot of people are forced to go, because, but it is great, I love Telegram, I, I, I only found out about it because of cryptocurrency, I deal with a lot of that stuff, and then I found out that a bunch of other people use it like cool people like you and so here's a softball question oh but i was going to ask what 
Are you the only one who posts to your uh, Telegram channel? To my channel, mostly. Okay. I have I have uh, one guy who who. If there's anything on there that's edgier, it might be the, the guy that sometimes forwards things for me, who I sometimes have to give a slap on the wrist to. Yeah. Um, sometimes he'll post a. Sometimes he'll forward a really good meme, but it'll for, be from a channel called something like Zyklon forty eight fourteen eighty eight, is it, because it's a it's a perfectly right. acceptable, funny mainstream joke. But he's he's found it forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and doesn't notice that the channel it's from is called some hor- he, heinous neo Nazi thing. So occasionally I have to like take yeah. that down slap on the wrist because there's a few there's a few of those on there and i'm like uh yeah i did see something today about how they want like some super um neo-nazi like anti-semite channel wanted to debate you over text Oh yeah. Um, they, well, you see, the funny thing about the he's he's like properly full in neo-Nazi. This guy. And so right. I, when I was when I was talking to Nicholas Fuentes last night, I played some audio from that guy, and I explained what my problems were with it. You know, it's a misreading of the Bible. Uh, it's you know ludicrous to claim this, that, and the other. And the whole basis for his argument was actually a Jewish invention, which he's using to attack Jews, which is ironic. Uh, you know, I just basically dismantled what I felt to be the, the flaws in his argument. And, and of course, everyone's a clout chaser and a star fucker. So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, Milo noticed me. So he's got to tell his fans diss me. But actually, it's just like, oh, my God, Milo noticed me. So so mm-hmm. now he wants to, like, debate to kind of double down on gra- getting some star attention. I don't know. I, people tell me this guy is kind of bad news. So uh, if I do it, the only way that I would do it was would be maybe have him on the show with a white Black Lives Matter supporter. Um, and just, just te- you know, Jerry Springer mm-hmm. style. That's how I feel. That's that's the, that's that's the best way to approach these things. I Why think. a white one? Well, because it's funnier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, this is this is the 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 what identity politics is a white preoccupation, right? It's white liberals on the one hand, and it's white far right guys on the other hand. It is a it's a it's a white preoccupation. So to show these things in their in their true light, I think you'd have to have two white people. Also it would be funnier. And um uh they're both clownish, right? So one of them is kind of like I don't know if you've you've read you know you read like Dr. Dr. Faustus uh, you know Faustus uh, uh, Marlowe and he's kind of like trying to be more and more and more outrageous trying to attract the attention of, of you know Mephistopheles and, and the devil and all that all the rest of it and he's like you know um, uh, he's just trying to be desperately wicked and I get the same impression sometimes from these uh, from from the 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 wig nets they're called on Telegram it's just like they're trying so hard to be so shocking and so outrageous and I just think oh bless you um, and and and, and is that uh, you know caricaturing even their own positions and of course the Black Lives Matter guys on the other side. Are equally as bonkers so uh, you know it's it's at that point when it's so clownish i don't know what value there is in having a quote-unquote debate but i'd certainly love to put the two opposite ends in a room together and see what happens i remember you Uh, said something about on your recent show last night's show you said something about how there's like a justified you know hate not hatred but like people like blacks feel unjust there's an un they're pissed off at the yeah so 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 uh this guy alt some uh, skull his the the, the, the neo nazi guy uh, says that blacks can't live uh, together with whites because they'll never be able to successfully operate in white culture and they'll always feel resentful and envious at the success of the white man um, and this was one of his arguments for you know for for separating the races in addition to a misreading of the bible which was a mistake of of his you know just because he hadn't read around the mm-hmm. passage in question and to which my response was oh so in the ethno state there'll be no envy or adultery or theft like are you out of your mind <laughs> like what is wrong with you uh, right. and, and 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 i and i, I and um i i also said yeah there there are there are feelings about whites from a black community in america but they're justified you know there is a justified set of grievances because as far as black people are concerned republicans have been ignorant and democrats have been malevolent uh and there hasn't really been very much done for them since slavery and not enough anyway and and so i mean i'm married to an african-american i have two kids in the house that are one of them's his kid and one of them is 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 the cousin um and you know i i spend a lot of time in in you know uh, around all of that and see the neighborhoods that you know that some of my extended family come from and all the rest of it they don't have good schools and they should have good schools they don't have good services and they should have good services and and i don't i don't think we owe mexicans pouring over the southern border a damn thing um i think the border the, the border on the south should be permanently closed mm-hmm. um but i think america still owes the black community something because I, do, I don't think that um, black america has been properly um 
Uh, people just, in the chat, I, I fixed the audio issues. This is my first time doing a, a live <laughs> Skype thing. Thank you for telling me about it. I, it's, it'll be fine on the podcast version. Boom, bang. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off, Milo. That was a gr beautiful answer to a, a shitty half-baked question. Let me ask. No, <laughs> but it's an important point because people people uh, sometimes don't anticipate that answer from me. But it's um... yeah. When did you get so safe? It's like no, 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 no. It's, I promise that's the only woke opinion I have. That was is woke. The, is, yeah, it's the only woke opinion I have. And, I, and I, if, 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 if we're to have reparations, I don't want people handed cash. So you are for reparations? Well, maybe, uh, okay. but not, not money. I don't want people to be handed cash because obviously that's going to go nowhere. So but social I, I, currency? I wouldn't mind having a, a world-class academy or a school of some kind in every black neighborhood. That's so that fair. Smart, Smart black kids can go to Harvard if they're clever enough, right? And we don't have to have affirmative action because they actually have good enough schools even if they have no money. So it right? wouldn't be that, affirmative that, action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like educational meritocracy. Because they would start out at a level that's already good enough where they wouldn't need affirmative action. Right. They would just right because although they may have they may have problems at home and and they may not have a lot of money and all the rest of it. When they go to school, they have access to world class teachers. You know, we pay the best teachers triple and move them into black neighborhoods, uh, and 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 that that kind of thing. So, uh, and, if, and if that was disproportionately and purposefully spent specifically on black neighborhoods, uh, specifically for black children i'd be fine with that like i mean uh, not if that and if you want to call that reparations i think that it's something that's owed and i think i would be okay with that so here's where i'll sound like a republican like i don't know if i would even call that reparations i would call that like a redistribution of wealth because in order for us to pay for those schools it would have to come from other communities through well, the Hispanics, tax, you know. ideally, who have who have swamped the United States and contributed absolutely nothing to yeah. culture, to the economy. I mean, what 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 has been the benefit to America of mass Hispanic immigration? Nothing. But you look at the culture of America, and it's this amazing fusion of black and white, right? Okay. Of African and European. This is jazz. This is hip hop. This is all this stuff, right? Is a fusion of African and European, and and, and uh, it seems to me like American popular culture, American history, literature, the history of America, socially, culturally, everything is a fusion of of, of black and white. But I don't know what the hell America gets out of Mexicans being here. I don't know. What Are you America talking gets illegal out. ones or just any any? any I, what does America get out of this? Unless okay. they're doctors unless they're lawyers, unless they're coming over here creating jobs or filling a need that America gets, why are they here? Why are they in this country? There's no reason, right? Are no just talking about Mexico or any well, southern... And it was non -like, you know, I mean, look, I don't see any benefit to the United States from anything coming from Latin America. Okay. You know, Central and South America. I don't see the point of it. Uh, I think America should have a system where you can come over if you have something to offer. If America's short on doctors, come from wherever, but be a doctor, right? If America's short on electricians, come from wherever, but you've got to be an electrician. Uh, you know, this is the Australian quota system where what the country needs defines the policy versus mere accidental geography, which is insane. Gotcha, gotcha. I got to I got to read something from the comments is too funny a comedian named Bobby Bud says Milo should take a lesson from Jordan Peterson and clean his room <laughs> This is this is my dressing room and it's always a mess Oh it's um, your dressing room there you go Yeah no it's it's a, it's it's there's there's a few racks of this and around the corner but it is always it is always a tip um, I only come in here to do things like this and oh, not okay. So, so I don't worry. I don't. I don't typically live like this. This is just my dressing room, which is the the one room in the house that I, I let myself go in. Fair the answer. Is, I, the rest of the house is exquisite. I promise. I'm in front but, of a um, green screen, so, so you can't see what's going on behind me. To your point, nobody needs to take any tips from Jordan Peterson on anything. <laughs> None. Like even like the trans, the like not letting liberals walk over you with like control of language and all that. Well, yeah, the only good thing he ever did is how he became famous. Everything after that, it was a mess. Oh, really? So you don't care about what he says about, like, the Bible? Uh, he doesn't really understand <laughs> it. I mean, he, he hasn't really... Ever, you know, he, he has some lectures that are, are, are okay, but the, the problem is... The, I'm not saying Jordan Peterson never says anything smart or useful. I'm mm -hmm. obviously exaggerating, but uh, but the problem is he hasn't read any new books in 30 years, okay. you know? 
he talks about the same people, Sultanates and Nietzsche, you know, uh, the same Bible stories. I mean, every lecture, uh, every, he's got like three lecture series and that's it. And every time he talks, it's just more of the same. And a lot of it's just, you know, incomprehensible bilge. But, um, but otherwise, it's, you know, once you watch those lect- three lecture series, that's great. The problem mm-hmm. with a lot of people who become famous is they get frozen in time. Right. Because they, they get overwhelmed with the fame and money and they don't want it to leave. And they're terrified of things drying up or, or, or mm-hmm. disappearing as quickly as they came. So they stop growing. I have, I've learning. heard someone say that before, and at, like, how do you get around that? As you have to be okay. It 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 takes it takes courage because you have to be okay with uh, waxing and waning over the mm-hmm. years of your career. So people with long careers who constantly reinvent themselves in pop, you know, you, like Prince, Madonna, Michael Jackson, in literature, lots of examples in music. Um, there are composers who are, are famous at various points in their career, uh, particularly the romantics, you know. Um, and, and so anyway, the, the, the point is, media figures, you have to be okay with, like, waxing and waning. Like, Ann Coulter, megastar in the 90s. It wanes a bit in the in the 2000s. And then she's back in the Trump era with two books that basically define his presidency, right? Um, and meanwhile, throughout, she's being responsible with her money so she doesn't have to, like, you know, go through any catastrophes. She continues to put books out. She continues to do her job. She's around, but she understands that the p- things fall in and out of favor. Things fall in and out of fashion. Um, you can continue to grow and learn and be true to yourself. And you will, over the course of a 30, 40 year career, have big highs and some more fallow periods, right? Um, and that's normal and that's fine. What what will definitely happen though, if you freeze the first time you get famous and you never grow, is that that's the best it'll ever get for you. Versus, you know, the rising and falling of, of a career as you learn more and think more and as, as the environment around you changes, you don't know what can happen. There's plenty of people who were a bit famous and then dropped off and then came back as megastars, right. um, you know, particularly in music. So that so uh, it, it takes courage and you have to be, you have to kind of like, you have to be a responsible person and put money away and, and like, you know, buy houses and don't spend it all on bullshit, um, which I have done sometimes and not done sometimes. I don't uh, blame but, Jordan Peterson for kind of letting the fame crush him a little bit. Like, he seems like a very a sensitive he's dude. Killed, he's been killed by it. He's been killed I mean, by guy, He's in guy, rehab, I think. Yeah, he's crying on television. It's a fucking mess. This is, this, is, this is the guy that you're looking up to for help. This is your self-help <laughs> guru, the guy who can't fucking be on, a t- on TV without crying. Are, are you out of your That's, mind? That is for you. The book is ludicrous, but um, but uh, no, it, it just it, it's he's a very bad role model. This is a, a this twelve rules for life is like how to be how to survive, how to get away with being being mediocre and not getting crushed by life. Well, I don't, I'm not particularly interested in in that. I, I my fans aren't mediocre people. My fans are losers who want to be great. You know, Gosh. not mediocre people who want to stay mediocre. I like gamers. I like you know all these people who have been left behind by society, the, particularly young men, uh, and especially in some cases young white men, but not always. Um, some young women as well. The people that I like, that I try to help, are the people who are, have been left behind, and they're not striving for mediocrity. They're striving for greatness. Um, and Jordan Peterson is like how does how to stay mediocre? Hmm. Um, you know, it just you know this all like don't lift your head above the parapet shit that that he has midway through that book. It just makes my flesh crawl because what are you telling people? You're telling people not to be great, not to strive for things you're telling people stay in your lane right. that's what he's talking about with really? the hierarchy stuff jordan peterson is all about staying in your lane and 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 you know and, and surviving because he's a marxist because he thinks that the primary project of life is is to he's avoid a marxist things. jeez yeah well in the sense in in the specific sense that you know marxism is about alleviation of suffering right this is the basis of, of marxism really it says life is miserable terrible painful hell and here's how you get through it and here's how you deal with the the pain and the misery well i don't happen to believe that because i'm christian you know i've jo- i have joy in my heart i think the high i think the highest thing you can um the highest thing you can achieve is is getting into heaven but also living a good life having a family um you know experiencing beautiful art that brings you closer to the divine jordan peterson has never uh, as far as i can tell uh, ever 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 um, shown any 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 innocent, untrammeled joy. Hmm. He's so fucking miserable. Well, yeah, he's, he does cry so a lot. He's a softy. He's, I mean, he's horribly sad. <laughs> he's just a sad, not yeah, sad, yeah. He's just a sad person. I don't look up to people like that. I look up to you know a different, a different kind of people, and I think a different kind of people like me than like him. Uh, but he just he's just miserable and sad, and I just look at him. And I'm like. Who is who are these people who are looking up to you? This is this is distressing to me. Interesting. I know yeah. that I get it because he's like a sweet uncle that you right. kind of want to hug and and you know and he had some good 
in the 90s. He just hasn't had any since. I like seeing him go up against people. He usually looks good in arguments. Like, he kicks ass in, like, a lot of segments where, you know, with, like, feminists. Like, have you never um, felt the ne- You've He's... never wanted to cry after one of those intense interviews that you've done? No, of course <laughs> I don't want to cry after an interview. What, what, the, what is wrong with him? What yeah. is, I know what's wrong with him. He's permanently drugged up. He's on antidepressants all the time. That's why he wants to cry all the time, because he's on fucking drugs. He's on drugs all the time. Yeah, that's true. He's he is on drugs. So this, that, and the other. No, I don't want to cry after a conversation <laughs> on television. I'm fine. Like, you know, sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it doesn't go well. Like, get a grip. So how uh, do you deal with the negativity? Like, obviously, you deal with. you have to deal with it somehow. I mean, you... Uh, well... Uh, not by crying, obviously, but... I mean, not really. By getting even. By getting revenge. even, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, double revenge. down. Is it, no, but I mean, like, you know, righteous fury Mm -hmm. uh you know it's like this person has wronged me and i will make sure that they know about it and do far worse to them in a righteous way that doesn't make doesn't lower me that doesn't make me a bad vindictive evil person but which you know sets the scales back uh as as they as they should be no the way you the way you feel better about things is revenge not crying who wins when you cry they do well now you get revenge you're reminding me of uh trump's uh trump's opera operandi modus operandi whatever the fuck he does not cry you got it right <laughs> trump does dude, not cry yeah. he t- he gets revenge yeah he gets even he gets even he gets he gets the mf's back you know so if he doesn't get impeached i mean are you still supporting him i don't days? know is anybody is that um <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, it, it, it has, there is no wall, his signature campaign Yeah, what promise. the fuck? Where's the wall? He's, he's done almost nothing for his core supporters. He's done plenty for Israel, which I actually don't mind because I'm a Zionist, you know, like I, I am very pro-Israel. We need somewhere to, to, to nuke Mecca from. That's as good a place as any. <laughs> um, like, I'm perfectly pro-Israel. I'm fine <laughs> with that. But, um, but I don't really see that he's done very much for his core supporters, like for the Appalachian people who, you know, like the the, yeah. the Appalachian states that put him in office that were the difference between success and failure for him uh, and all of the other traditional conventional Republican, you know, whatever. He, he doesn't seem to be he doesn't seem to believe in his own um, manifesto, yeah. his own his own election commitments. He hires people who are diametrically opposed to him ideologically. And and some people will try to fudge and say, oh, well, he's this guy who just likes creative chaos and he always surrounds himself with differing opinions mm. to see who wins. Yeah, but could he hire like three people that actually agree with his agenda and his base? No, That's how you look got- at it? Because from my from this point of view, from this liberal point of view, he they think he only surrounds himself with people who think the same who? as him. Who? I don't Who? know. Like Stephen the, Miller is the, the only person left. The There's brain nobody surgeon else. guy is he still working? Ben I mean, Carson. Yeah, who's Ben. In a particular, what? What? What is it? What is his job even? I can't even remember. Uh, is he like housing or something? Who cares? Gotcha, gotcha, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about his chief of staff. His his uh, his foreign. What do you call a foreign secretary in this country? Secretary of State. Um. Uh. You know. I'm talking about the people who run the country with right. him. Housing secretary. Who cares? Like. You know. That I. I want to know who are the people around Trump, advising Trump, helping him make decisions who actually agree with his agenda. Stephen Miller. That's it. Okay. There is nobody else. Hmm. No one else. Um, and there were a few. There was Bannon. There was all the rest of it. Right. But they've gone now. They've, they've gone, gone, and he's not hiring new ones. And everybody knew that surrounds himself is is uh, is is more in line with uh, the Javanka worldview, which is kind of Javanka? New York oh. centrist. Vote both ways. Donate both ways. Depending on which way the social winds are blowing. And now they're kind of having to like play Republicans on TV. I mean, but so they're... you were like one of the earliest trump supporters like the most vocal earliest ones probably right like i would say so you take credit for getting him elected uh i don't know if you well, still I do I just, yeah. give me credit but some of the people who give me credit works on the campaign so um okay. i take i take their compliments seriously uh i think i take them seriously and, I, and i'm uh, it's gratifying to hear that kind of thing sure you were uh, a trump supporter when it was before it was cool to be one like i'm well, late was, well, yeah i'm not just not just that but i made it cool you made it um, cool so so uh, yeah, but but I, I don't think it's cool anymore because I don't think he's cool anymore. Shit. So who is who is cool then? Like who would Marianne you? Marianne Williamson. Okay. Marianne Williamson is cool. I think she's fucking cool. I think she's really really cool. Um, Tulsi, by the way, is not cool. Mm-hmm. So you can snap snap out of it. Yeah, she doesn't snap seem that fiery. She's not even no, but it's like she's she's hot for a politician. 
But in sure. the real world, she's a seven, maybe. And yeah. Yeah. people go crazy over her. Like, people yeah. on the right go crazy over Tulsi. But what? Because she manages to slap Kamala Harris? Like, who can't? I mean, this is a this is a woman who isn't even really black. She's, she's Jamaican and Indian, presuming to speak on behalf of slave-descended African-Americans, right? Which is which is gross, first of all. Um, and black voters know it, and that's why they don't like her. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. um, uh, she's, 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 she's not woman- authentic. No, she's not authentic. And she's a woman who's uh, um, responsible for withholding evidence that would, have put, that would have released an innocent black man as prosecutor. And then when challenged about it, her response is, I'm proud of my record. How is this person going to win the Democratic nomination? How? She's not. And so Tulsi getting a few points on her doesn't really impress me very much um, because it's so easy. It's, so you, just, in the end, you kind of are rooting for a Democrat. <clears throat> no, not no. only Marianne Williamson, gotcha. who's, now, who's been edged out by the machine. So you don't give a fuck about party labels. You will go towards any party as long as the candidate is in, aligned with your yeah views. i mean I'm, I'm obviously you know marianne all of marianne's policy positions are directly opposed to what i believe in i just think that she should be the one running against trump because it would be more exciting uh, okay think, your, your question was who's cool and i think yeah marianne, there you go um but uh i'm certainly not a republican if that's what you mean yes okay i'm not, I'm not a republican i'll follow whoever is is sounds sensible to me look i come from europe and Britain is now five percent Muslim, and it's the and it's going. Mm-hmm. I'm gay. I don't want to die. I want to live in a nice country where people are nice to gays. And nice countries where people are nice to gays tend to be European Christian countries. And European countries are ceasing to be Christian. Partly, there's a variety of factors, all of which were kicked off in the Enlightenment. But a major contributory factor to the hostility to that Jews, me, women, many of my friends gays me uh you know feel in mm-hmm. europe is, is thanks to islam and i i don't want it for america i don't want it here i moved here to get away from it i don't want it here too um here's some just while well, it's fresh on my mind do you think epstein uh, killed himself i i know that he did not that he did not all right you're on that side of it seems like the more popular there's, side. No, there's no side <laughs> of it there's not a person in america who believes that jeffrey epstein committed suicide there isn't a single person walking. i think i there is nothing, i'm cannot, one of them because not go out onto the street and find me a regular person who <laughs> well, isn't I'm saying not a, I'm not a regular person. No, but, but you're, you know, like, not a media figure, someone who's yeah. saying it for effect. Oh, oh okay. you've taken the contrary, like, contra- uh, you know, uh, I, I will never know if Fair you enough. take a counterintuitive position uh, for the sake of it. But right. you can't go out and find me a normal person who, uh, provided they know who the hell he is and know the story, who thinks that he killed himself. You can't find anybody. I was on the island. You were on the island? No, but that'd be cool. Then if I was another actual authority figure. No, I just think Occam's Razor tells you that, well, would he want to go through that trial and be infamous in prison for the rest of his life? Why wouldn't he kill himself? Okay, so when people say Epstein didn't kill himself, what they're doing is gesturing toward a, 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 a... a cluster of related conspiracies. One of them is that somebody went into his room and strangled him. But another one might be that the guards were paid to look the other way and a message was sent to him saying, if you want to do it, tonight's the night, no one will stop you, right? So when people say Epstein didn't kill himself, I think that they're including that kind of conspiracy in it, right? Where somebody goes in, pays the guards to to twitch the cameras off to, you know, because now we know both the guards like kind of didn't do their jobs properly. Oh, shocking, you know, like whatever. It could be something like that. That that's kind of like that's to, seems to me a, a plausible way of doing it, where you know somebody goes by the door and says, "You're gonna want to you're gonna want to finish it tonight." You mm-hmm. know, throws him a throws him a, a bed sheet that he can actually use because you can't use the bed sheets in in solitary because they they tear. You know, when you try to hang yourself. Um, Isn't it possible you know, that even he himself tried to conspire with the guards to try to make that happen? If he really wanted to kill himself. I mean, maybe. Maybe he had some way of paying them, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I guess it's possible, but the point is that well, he was... Uh, I convinced he, Milo. No, no, I said it's possible. I still don't believe that it's, possible. Net, it's net likely. And in any yeah. case, the question the question remains, this is like the most high-profile prisoner who is right. uh, connections to the, to the rich, to the famous, and all the rest of it. Just magically, he's the one that manages to kill themselves. I mean, who wouldn't? It, it, you, what you're saying is, mm-hmm. wouldn't somebody who's about to be on trial for these kinds of crimes want to kill themselves? Well, it, in my experience from reading about these things, no. He's been through this already. He's been in jail for True. it before. And some of his rich and famous friends did. The, the 
my experience, people, you know, I have put three child molesters behind bars in my reporting career, right? My experience with these people is they are utterly without remorse. All they want is to get back out, to get back at it. They want to get they want to get started again. They, they'll go through the trial. They'll go through incarceration. Uh, they want to get back out there and get their hands on people again. Um, they don't um, typically want to end it all and all the rest of it. Uh, and indeed, even someone like Epstein, even with his connections, even with his address book, even with his money, even with all the attention, he didn't do it last time. Why did he suddenly do it this time? And he's such a high profile prisoner. How mm-hmm. could it be that, that there weren't special measures taken to keep an eye? Look, just these two guards sitting in the office and, you know, for four hours, they just kind of look the other way. And magically, he manages to end up dead. Does anyone buy that? Does anyone think that's likely? Well, no. it is a fascinating topic. And I'm glad you had some to say about it. And I think it'll be one of those things that, you know, takes a while and, or we'll never know, really. But no, it's like the, it's like the, um, the, the Vegas shooter. Mm-hmm. We've known every time someone shoots up a school, we have his whole Instagram, like within seven minutes, someone's tweeted his Instagram. Someone's told you who his family are. We know where he lives. We know everything about him. What do we know about the Vegas shooter? Mm-hmm. Nothing. Really? You know, nothing. We don't what, know anything. What is there to know about him? He's just some dude. Why he did it. <laughs> Why he did people, it. Yeah. All these people leave trails. And as soon as some people started suggesting there might be an al-Qaeda connection or some kind of Islamic connection. Everything suddenly went dead. The security guard disappeared and reappeared ages later with a different timeline, a different story. The hotel themselves changed their story and changed the timeline like four times. Um, right. There's so much up with that. There's weird. so much. There are so many weird unanswered questions about that shooting. I think that he was either radicalized or paid to do it. I think it was an... Uh, it's weird because normally they claim credit for it, but I think it was a, an Islamic thing. And because it, w- it was on a country music festival, can you imagine what the reaction of Appalachia and the South in this country would have been to a country music festival getting shot up? I think they covered it up because they didn't want an outpouring of anti-Muslim sentiment, out to anti this, that, and okay. the other. Remember, the intelligence services are not like, you know, like they were in the movies in the 90s or like, you know implied republicans uh the, the law enforcement always rep- implied republicans the cia is not like that anymore and neither is the fbi uh they're both they are both anti-trump to their bones mm-hmm. in their core they hate donald trump uh and they're on their best day they're centrist these days uh now i i just i just think um that there's a, there's there's definitely I've a conspiracy a there's for a decade and I know when something doesn't smell right, even if I don't know what's wrong with it. Okay. And that doesn't smell right. Definitely. Yeah, and, I mean, it was a lot of bodies. You're So, so far, you're taking the side of conspiracy on two things. I, br- or I brought up one, and then that led to two conspiracy theories. Would you call yourself a conspiracy theorist? That's, the, that's not the th- second. No, you also I mean, said I the frogs. I, but, that's I three. Mean, if, if, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's conspiracy fact. That's fact, uh, right. No, uh... If you call me a conspiracy theorist for thinking there's something up with Not the, that I care, yeah. Ve- well, no, I'm I'm saying, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Kind of, if you call me a conspiracy theorist for thinking there's something up with Vegas and for thinking that Epstein didn't kill himself, you're calling two thirds of the American populate uh, pu- public conspiracy theorists too. True, because I think I probably share those opinions with two thirds of, of Americans, at which point the term ceases to to hold its meaning, right? So I think a conspiracy theorist would be somebody right. who. And I, I helped to, I was research assistant in a book about this once upon a time called Counter Knowledge. Um, I think conspiracy theorists have a particular kind of mind where they draw connections and perhaps see connections that aren't there. Where conspiracy theorists typically have a, a web of beliefs that aren't really supported by the facts, all of which seem to kind of tangentially mutually reinforce one another, but, but nothing really holds together. And you pull one out and the whole thing collapses. Um, just merely thinking there's something up with the official line on a couple of high-profile news stories doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist. Mm-hmm. It makes you uh, it makes you prudent and uh, cautious and smart. Because I don't really believe very much of what the federal government tells me about everything, and everything in my everything I've ever learned tells me that's a that's a sensible position to hold. Well, it is good to be skeptical. Yeah, I just for some reason I just feel that um, after watching a lot of Joe Rogan. I just feel like, yeah, yeah, it's just a bunch of people who just want to chase after some dragon, like UFOs. Like, I love a lot of, like, not all of the consp- I'm not, a, I don't care about that many conspiracies, but I do like UFOs. That's about it, though. I don't care about the right. politics stuff. Like, the shooter guy, 
the Vegas shooter, I think he just had a shit ton of unspent ammunition, and he saw a great opportunity to, to mow down a bunch of people, and he was had a screw loose. <laughs> but I feel like a raving lunatic just saying that by not partaking well, in I, the conspiracy. Well, I don't know because I, well, I followed that story quite closely, and I've noticed some patterns in when when there are like panicky changes of timelines and things keep shifting as somebody says, Oh no, but we've got to tell them this. Okay. So we'll have to say that happened at 12 and there's kind of a new time revised timeline comes out and the explanations for the revised timeline are never quite very, con never quite convincing enough because it has to be rushed. I've seen the signs of it now, right? When, being a journalist, one of, your, one of your skills is like how to spot lies, you know? <laughs> and, and I just, there's things where I think, yeah, fine. Sandy hook for me seems what happened happened. I don't have any questions about that, uh, particularly, but, um, I do have questions about Vegas. I think most people have questions about so Vegas. So you I think followed you, it with, with the more sober you learn about eyes, it, the yeah. it smells Vegas. Yeah. Like, I mean, you seem reasonable cause you actually looked into it and actually like you're more informed than me on it. And it's not like you just do a bunch of psychedelics and have like, you seem pretty, I think a lot of the conspiracy theorizing is from people of a particular generation. I think it's Gen Xers who did do psychedelics uh, yeah. in the sixties and seventies. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not joking because yeah, you know, yeah. every generation. Every generation is kind of de uh, is defined by its drugs, right? So currently we have soporifics. Mm -hmm. People want to take oxy. People want to just like numb themselves to the horror of everyday life, you know. So yeah, there's weed and there's and there's um, and there's oxy. Go back to the 80s and it was quaaludes and cocaine it's intensifying right people want to feel more because everyone's kind of like feeling alive and confident and and bolshy and all that um you know you go back a little further every every kind of every generation has its own drug of choice and and for those people who were taking psychedelics in the 60s and 70s well this is like uh, older gen x right uh, young boomers right. and these are the people who typically have driven conspiracy theories people who would now be i guess like uh 55 um those are your those are your prime conspiracy theory theorist eight you know uh that's the prime conspiracy theorist age bracket i mean it now. makes sense because that was fueled probably by the jfk assassination other exactly. kooky shit going exactly. on with, yeah so the whole world suddenly got ripped apart in the 60s and 70s and things that were previously unfathomable and unthinkable began to happen the moon landings mm -hmm. and jfk right these are things that people couldn't wrap their head around it actually happened and when you ca when you couple that with the fact that people were doing mushrooms they were taking L LSD. They were taking these drugs that, and you can see this in academia too. Um, a lot of academics of about that kind of age, 55, 65, they are engaged in multidisciplinary uh, study where you see patterns in one discipline pop up in another one, right? Uh, where you use um, some kind of, uh, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you read it, when you read a literary text, you can read, you do a Marxist reading, you can do a feminist reading, you can do deconstruct, you know, there's, there's all these kinds of layers that you can put on top of something in order to understand it. And then sometimes one of those it has like a black spot where it's like, oh, well, the Mayans knew about this and this, this. the same kind of academic inquiry, this multidisciplinary stuff that the, that the, the founders of, and, you know, they're all now 55 and 65, this, you know, anything ending in studies, right? where they pull together stuff from all over the place and just put the meshes over each other and see what what lines up. That was started by people who are now 55 and 65 who were, you know, coming of either born or, or very young in that period and who um, who now, maybe they're a little older than I'm suggesting, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, but and, and the pe people who were smart went into academia, people who were maybe less smart ended up conspiracy theorists because they had that same mindset of like, drawing disparate connections between seemingly random, un, uh, you know, unconnected things and bringing them together and creating. So that, that's a very much of the moment kind of attitude. And I think it comes directly out of, as you say, the events that happened in the 60s and 70s. And I think of the drugs people were taking. That and, makes and, sense. Yeah, and I didn't think they... People, I, people I, like this who didn't take any drugs, but it, 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 it's about the... It's about the atmosphere. It's about how people were thinking. And there are definitely differences in how people think across generations and across time. And I think there's this um, stigma against conspiracy theorists that kind of goes back to the, it kind of connects with the uh, the OK Boomer meme. It's like we want to section off baby boomer ideologies. Like, oh, you're just a baby boomer. That's why you believe this crazy shit. Or if you're on the, if you're right wing, and happen to have some beliefs like you just laid out they use that as a weapon against you and i don't know there's nothing wrong with believing that there's something going on that's 
under the Look, table? Let's be honest. There is often something going on. I mean, you know, the, the, there's there's often something a bit more to it than the story. This is why, you know, the government has a... I mean, look, it's, it's, not, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a matter of historical record that the CIA uses the Washington Post and always has, right? Iran-Contra, like, it's a matter of historical record. Serious historians have written books about this. It is accepted that the CIA has, for decades, used the Washington Post as an outlet, you know, to leak stories, to to help create. That one is so left wing right now. It's so far right, to the left. Right, right, right. Yeah. CIA is too. I mean, in many ways. Okay. Some, I didn't know, know that. The point is that. Speaking of that, oh, CIA. What about DEA? And here's one that I just thought of: fentanyl. Do you right. think there could be a conspiracy for population control? With all this fentanyl going around to kill people, do you think that could be a conspiracy? Uh, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's population control. I think where the government's concerned, I normally come down on the side of incompetence versus malice or conspiracy. Right. Uh, normally, it's just because the federal government is absolutely crap at everything. But it is interesting that you know people that. It's not interesting in the sense of like there's something going on here. It's frustrating as a taxpayer that. Fentanyl seems to come through, come over the border, you know, uncontested, and millions of, you know, enough fentanyl keep coming over to kill millions of people. Yet, you know, the the customs is picking up, you know, that that modafinil I tried to order from India, you know, <laughs> like that kind of stuff gets caught every mm. time, all the time. Uh, you know, there's this every, every time you want to. What do like, you get from buy, India? You get some from India? What? No, I was. Just, I mean, I'm just speaking. Oh, okay. I thought you were uh, actually talking about yourself. But but. Um, no, but but you know, it were somebody to, to, to try to do that, or or, or uh, um, you know, you, you you try to buy shoes or a phone or something, and it gets held up in customs because they want another fifty dollars from you for what all the rest of it. Okay. Yet at the same time, enough fentanyl comes over to kill the whole population every right. year. Yeah, what's going so, on with that? How does that happen? You know, uh, it, it's it's it's. I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's just a, a, a frustrating right. as a taxpayer that the government is so crap at everything. I well, mean, that's look, fair. At the, look at the TSA. Um, TSA until they got humiliated and had to improve the the um their standards tsa had like a 95 percent fail rate when they tested these these you know buffoons in airports to see if that they could they could find knives and drugs they had a 95 percent fail rate they still have an 80 percent fail rate they miss four in five things this is one of my favorite things online it's like go is is you go and you find um you know, like tweets and 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 screenshots of, of of Snapchats of people who took needles onto airplanes. You know, <laughs> there's people shooting up on air, in airplane toilets because Shit. most of the time you don't get caught. Uh, and sounds, it's, like it's an the, uh, sounds like an argument against the. Sounds like an argument against the wall. If if people are getting success at you know smuggling contraband over airplanes, no, it's an, no, it's an argument for a better wall. A and better, a better wall and and better. No, look, there's no. The existence of TSA is not the problem. TSA is the problem. Right, like right, right. how it is. So they hire, they, they purposefully hire stupid people. Um, they hire for dumb, as lots of government departments do, because they want people who can follow the rules, right? They want somebody who will just reflexively follow the rules um, and, and be able to do that all day, every day, and not deviate from, you know, the, the, the template that, that's been given to them. So they hire for stupid, and they get stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, and these people are, are, are not only rigid and inflexible when something is technically in violation but is obviously fine but they're also dumb so they miss all the stuff they should be looking for um it's 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 just it's it's maddening and the problem is not that there is a tsa the problem is that the tsa is so bad okay um do you mind if i switch it up to some social issues some questions about sure. that all right okay. let's go deep into that have you ever deconverted a feminist back into a regular woman yeah, hundreds of hundreds thousands of, of them. That's mm -hmm. why the left hates me so much. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah, yes, famously and often. Yes. Well, that's good because I. So it's not just that you. It's not like an un. It's a worthy battle then. Of course, because it, I want be, not because I, I not because I hate women, it's because I want to save women. I want women to be happy. Well, there you women go. Who are feminists are not happy. So you do come from an angle of love, not hate. Of course, it's only I, other people who say people I hate yeah. Vapors. So there you uh, go. It's a mischaracterization and, to say and that I think you're that's, hate. I think that's justified. Uh, yes. Vapors and cyclists. Cyclists? Yeah. You're, you're anti-cyclist. Very anti-cyclist. I, I agree with you on that. I didn't know that was a thing to be... I mean, I, I like well, there that. Are, there aren't many acceptable bigotries left. I think you're allowed <laughs> to hate gingers in Britain. You're allowed to hate fat people just about uh, <laughs> much everywhere. 
you're allowed to hate um actually i think it's a sit really gingers and fatties um you can't gingers haven't quite got themselves cla- classified as a I, the race, yes. I actually you talked know, about gingers on the on the people. last episode. Um, yeah, gingers. There's an anti red hair stigma. You know, I kind of became aware. It, it the, comes from it comes from England, and it, it, it's his. Well, actually, I'm a bit of an expert on this. It's twofold. Mm-hmm. One uh, side of it is historic. Uh, anti ginger pre- prejudice reaches its zenith, its apotheosis in Britain, and it's where it comes from. It's where it's been inherited mm-hmm. from in, in the most cases. Remember. Why? Because uh, England is bordered by two red-headed nations that it has mm-hmm. uh, historically been at war with. Uh, Ireland, well, it's, well, excuse me, Ireland to the to the west. There is a sea in the middle, but it's not far away. Uh, and Scotland to the north, right? And there's the potato famine in Ireland. There's wars with the Scots. There's the Mel Gibson movie Braveheart. You know, Robert the Bruce. Um, the, the, to, to, the anti-redhead prejudice in England is. Uh, mainly rooted in historic conflicts with the Scots and with the Irish. But there's another dimension to it, the more dangerous dimension, which is genetics. Ginger hair is, uh, like freckles, with which it's often associated, is a product of a recessive gene, Mm -hmm. right? So two people with a recessive gene, and then there's chance that whatever. Um, We are, it seems, hardwired to seek out partners with a high degree of genetic mixing because it's better for evolution, right? This is why pretty much everybody in that ribbon of like, Israel, the Mediterranean, and like you know, round to Venezuela. There's that ri- in, there's that ribbon in the middle of kind of um, milky coffee colored people that mm-hmm. pretty much everyone finds hot mm-hmm. because it's like Africa meets Europe, right? So northern Africa, Egypt, you know, everybody kind of like the the hottest men and women from those regions are the hottest people in the world, right? Because they are a, a big genetic mixing oh, i see because because as a as populations we're kind of hardwired evolutionarily to to find to to, to go and seek out new genetic material because so there's it, something it's, ingrained it's, in our psyche and our it, psychology it, to be and to be stigmatized against redheads because they don't well, they lack it, they they lack genetic diversity so okay. we're hardwired to to to, to seek out um uh material that is different from our own if you like but it's the anti-incest instinct okay. right so because 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 homogenous gene pools ultimately die unless they have new material injected into them uh, variation at some point ends and they become diseased and they die out right so a small population of people who only breed with themselves have all kinds of unique genetic problems right they have they have all kinds of defects because the recessive uh, stuff asserts itself very strongly through the generations and becomes concentrated and, and you get you know like lots of kids born with birth defects in um incestuous places right so the middle east and, and then in some religious communes you get lots and lots of birth defects and lots of mental problems um, this is a problem in the Muslim world, right? The Muslim world is like, you know, like half uh, half the entire Muslim world, you know, is is married to their cousins. So right. you get it, this is a, this is the reason their IQ is plummeting, and it's also the reason you get a high degree of birth defects in places like Pakistan mm-hmm. and, and through the Middle East because everybody's inbred. Um, so we're we're kind of hardwired where it's available to to or where it's not forbidden by religious dictates as it is right. in, in, in the right. Muslim world um, to 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 marry out, as it were. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, the thing about uh, and for a high degree, specifically for a high degree of genetic diversity, if someone is a redhead, if someone has freckles, um, it's a signal to us that they have a, uh, they may have a low degree of genetic diversity because those things only assert themselves in particular communities and only when there isn't, you know, like if 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 if, if a Scot marries a uh, an African, it's highly unlikely that anyone they have, any of their descendants ever will have red hair, right? Because you suddenly introduce half of the. Um, suddenly half their DNA comes from a completely different group. So that recessive thing will never be able to assert itself. Right. So uh, one of the, one of the reasons people don't go for redheads and the studies kind of uh, establish this, even when, when you put a ginger person in a wig and make them dark haired, something about us just knows it's like with, with, with uh, transgender people, they could look, you know, like pretty much like a woman, but when you're standing next to a man, you just know, right? Like I'm a man, I'm attracted to men. And when I'm standing next to a man, I just know. And if it's a man in a wig and a dress, who's even when they've had hormones, I just something about me just I, they smell like a man, they feel like a man. I just mm-hmm. know it's a man, right? That's, um, right. Our bodies know things that our brains like sometimes haven't caught up with. Or so you're saying there's ob- it's obviously has to do with genetic diversity. So that makes me right. wonder is the part of the reason that same thing for anti-Semitism because of the small. Is that one of the reasons that causes that? This That's a really interesting it's question. It's got to be related. It's a really interesting question. I don't think that people are especially put off having sex with Jews. Because mm-hmm. I don't... Cause they're, they're hot. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Like uh, like Jewish w- women uh, often. Be- I mean, look at it. Look at Israel, right? Ev- literally everyone mm-hmm. in Tel Aviv is mm-hmm. right? right? Literally yeah, so everybody in Israel is a ten. Yeah. Everybody. There is no. There is no. If you see a if you see a if you see a nine in Israel, it's a tourist. Yeah. What's <laughs> like, going on with um, it? Yeah. <laughs> they're just. They're but that's just probably perfect. another reason people hate them is because they're very like elite in terms of physical attributes. Right. So maybe, so maybe you, it's yeah. not a depletion. Yeah. Of, yeah. You get over to the West and they're elite intellectually, right? Like uh, I say, the I mean, I'm I'm technically Jewish. I'm, I'm matrilineally speaking Jewish, so my mom is right. Jewish. Although I was raised. I'm Catholic. half I, through the father's side. Uh, you're not Jewish. Right. Uh, so uh, well, you know, oh, so, you're now so, you're gatekeeping me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're both we're ethnic both, gatekeeping. That's what that we're both is. Ish. You uh, mean religiously? I'm not, but ethnically, I have half genetic. Jewish material isn't yeah, that pretty you know, well you're not Jewish because your mother's not Jewish uh, the right, reason I know that th- I've heard of course I know that but ethnically I got the genes 50%. Yeah, so you, you, will, you will have inherited the high IQ what are you Ashkenazi exact yeah right so you've inherited the high IQ Nobel Prize winning whatever, so doesn't that right? count for something of course of course of course well, yes. you go, I'm then. just saying that your kids won't be Jewish no I got uh, that I got that that's Jewish yeah I got that Do you know where it comes from matrilineality why where uh so it, it's basically um it comes from it, it, it was it was done that way versus the christian way which is patriarchal it's arbitrary uh, yeah go ahead well it's not arbitrary seems it's like done, it is but go ahead it, it's done for a reason um matrilineal uh judaism was invented to enable jewish men to cheat and rape and right, their kids, I figured their, out. Yeah, their kids would not uh, stand to inherit, right? So they couldn't wow. come. They couldn't come asking for stuff, and they wouldn't be considered real children. Hmm. So this is because this is a problem with the with the Christian patriarchal, uh, you know, running through the father's so- side of the of the problem because men are dogs, right? So you know, the, the king will spread his seed, and then the bastard son will come claiming the throne or saying he should get a palace or something like that. So the the Jew, Jews being uh, always infinitely cleverer than this to say, well, what wow. if we just put this for the woman? Because, mm-hmm. you know, women are at home with the kids. They don't cheat as much. They well, at least they don't have, you know, whatever, or at least that was the thinking. Men can Back go off then, and do yeah. what men do, and it won't threaten the, the household and the, it, so, won't, it won't threaten the dynasty. Um, in, in, a way, in a way, it's much smarter, and it comes from a specific period in history. It's um, smarter? In, in a way, it's smarter because it, it solves a lot of the problems of patriarchal succession. Because if your if your bloodline passes through the man, mm-hmm. and men have children with women who are not their wives, especially powerful men like monarchs or aristocrats, you're creating all kinds of legitimacy issues. And, well, and I get all- that. So in, historically, that makes sense because the patriarchy was more obviously pro- predominant. Dominant these right. days, now that we got the reverse happening thanks to feminism and soy boys becoming yeah, more. Yeah, but those women aren't breeding. No, <laughs> those women they're not are, those breeding. Women are not, those women are not at the head of dynasties. They don't have families. But they're trying to be. The matriarchy <laughs> is rising as we speak. Would you no, not agree? It's not. No, for it to be, look, matriarchy is mother, not woman. Right? Okay. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it no, but but it's, but it's an gotta call it something. No, but it's an important dis- – yeah, it's, it's more okay. of a patriarchy. But because women it's really- are trying to gain power over men yeah, 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 and yeah, being yeah, more yeah. polyamorous. That's what I'm referring not, to. I'm not uh, – and they're behaving like men. They're getting more promiscuous. All of this is true, and there are these horrible statistics about how many men are raising kids that aren't theirs and they don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, I can't remember what the, the word for that is. All awful, yes, sure. But what they're creating is definitely not a matriarchy. It is not a family-centric – Right. Uh, it's not a family-centric – I mean, as a Catholic, like for us, the, the the central building block of society isn't the individual; it's the family, right? And 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 you're not building a society based on families and you know healthy social cohesion based on the family unit with the woman at the head of it and the woman passing on the you know the status. That's not what they want. That's not what these women are trying to accomplish. They don't want families. They don't want kids. They don't even, in many cases, want men at all. Well, okay. Um, I agree. With that. So, so, so I'm I'm nitpicking, but it's not a matri- it, it, It's important to, to to point out that it's not a matriarchy they want to create. If it was simply that they wanted the status, they wanted to go to work, and they wanted to be the ones whose name, like you know, whose whose name was kept, was passed down to the children. I mean, it would run contrary to human nature and to biology and to a bunch of other things. But it wouldn't be as bad as what we have now, which is. Um, 
this sort of you know lesbianic self-destructive uh that's a better uh, word lesbianic yeah it's a, it's i a, just it's use a, matriarchy as a tongue-in-cheek uh it's label because les- lesbiarchy because I don't, a, I don't believe in patriarchy either. So I, of course, I don't believe well, matriarchy. Do. You know. Why don't you believe in patriarchy? Thank, thank well, I praise mean, B for the patriarchy. Why believe in <laughs> patriarchy? It's fabulous. It's fabulous. Well, there you go. Okay, I guess of I never course. thought of it that way. I mean, first of, first of all, first of all, it often doesn't leave men in charge because women live longer. So when you consider patriarchal lines of succession in monarchy, very often it's a woman on the throne a lot longer than a man. And you know, so look, look, look at the, Engl- the history of the English monarch, for instance, right? Longest right. reigning monarchs, Victoria, Elizabeth, Elizabeth II. You know, look at the last hundred years of Britain. Right. By an enormous margin, we've had a queen more than we've had a king. And the queens behave in, in quite unexpected ways. For instance, when you look at history, queens are much more likely to start wars than kings are. Really? Um, yeah, because there's nothing a woman loves more than sending the men off to fight for on okay. her behalf. Right? Uh, you know, they, they, they love it. So, <laughs> so uh, I've never know. thought of it that way because I'm pretty conditioned by feminism to believe of that of patriarchy's sure. bad. But it's stupid because often not not only does patriarchy elevate women, you know, into their in, into into the position, you know, and this all comes from from Mary, right? This all comes from from the mother of God, elevates them into mothers and, and objects of veneration and worship and respect. And this is where chivalry comes from. Chivalry is a Christian invention, you know. It comes, it comes, it comes, treating women nicely starts with Christianity, really. Um, and, you know, consensual marriage, for instance, the woman having to say, I do as well, Christian, uh, chivalry, codes of... Codes so that of started with Christianity? Yeah, I mean, in the West, yes. Okay. Uh, t- treating women nicely, consensual marriage, uh, all, the, all the codes of chivalry that come from the Middle Ages, all Christian. Uh-huh. Um, and this is all about elevating women. Women were not in an elevated position in pagan Europe, in the Roman Empire, right? They, uh, women were chattel, uh, just, like the, just like the children. They were considered chattel. And indeed, there are Roman aqueducts blocked with the bones of female infants, um, you know, in the Roman Empire pre-Christianity, right? Because every time a, a, a man had a female child, it was like, dash its head on a rock and try again. Um, you know, uh, they, they were just, they were just uh, considered a, 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 a waste of time and money. Yeah, I feel like Christianity is kind of newer than, I mean, obviously it's newer than Judaism. And I was looking at like the 613 Jewish commandments. And there's some in there. Like, I feel like Christianity is like a revamped, condensed, clickbait version of the, of the 613. I mean, you know? It's like, because the Jews, I, I, they had some things about not using women as, like, property, not using them as slaves or something. So there was... It was, it was a, I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a step in the right direction. It wasn't really a... It wasn't, it wasn't a fix. Women, women, women in Judaism are not exactly... Yeah. Of, it was they, sloppily... There's right a lot point. of them. A lot of it's commandments. A it's a stop. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of rules. Yeah. Um, I think either side of Christianity, you have Islam and Judaism, both of which are very prescriptive religions, right? So the response of Muslims has been to lean into the rules um, and become uh, insane. And the uh, response of Jews, I think, has just been forget about. It. Excuse me, I'm sorry. No worries. Throwing things over the office. The response of, of Jews has just been oh, forget about it. It's fine. You know. So okay. so Jews are all now secular because it's just too much trouble to go through with it. Right. All. That's why um, I think Christianity is a more polished version of it because they just kept tacking on all these extra commandments oh shit we don't forget what these guys did to our fucking don't for don't forgive these people they just kept adding rules yeah i think there's some truth to that there's some accuracy in that and and also you know i think christianity just better reflects and fits human nature of okay. course each of these judeo-christian faiths will claim that they are the refined or perfected version of the previous one right. so you know you find christians who talk about quote unquote perfecting the jews um and then you'll find and, and then of course uh, uh um islam considers itself the you know the final revelation the, the the final revelation is the final perfect and unalter- unalterable word of god and it considers itself mm-hmm. perfected uh, the perfected judeo judeo judeo-christian tradition so much so that everyone is born muslim and and so coming c- converting to muslim to to islam is called reversion not conversion uh, uh you know to, to to muslims um and and that's why converting away is is a is a punishable apostasy because mm-hmm. it's just like unthinkable you know um so 
Well, no, it makes I'm, sense. That's why it's so rigid and strict and why there's so... it's so... Right, because this is the arrogance that comes with believing that your holy book and the Hadith and the Sunnah together represent the right. final, perfect, and unalterable mm -hmm. word of God. What that means is you can't be wrong. There's nothing else coming. So, you know, speaking of that... Again and change anything, and this is, this is why Islam is frozen in time in a way... Right, right exactly. Because of those three words, final, so perfect... So, that makes me wonder, like... If that's the perfect word of God, would you, you're not a Bible literalist, literarist, are you? Well, no, because the, because uh, I mean, pretty much every Christian, except for a couple of, of uh, small pockets of, of insanity, they know that the Bible was written by people. You're not a right? fundy. They have different versions of the same events. No, no, but the, you know, the Bible is written by people, some of whom have slightly different versions of the same event, even though they were all there. And this is right. the this, by the way, is the is the uh, you know the Gospels is the origin of uh, of that Kurosawa movie, right? Is is a uh, uh, ran where where there's a bunch of different people telling the story of the same thing that happened, and the you know the shogun mm -hmm. has to decide what actually went down. Uh, you know the, that that comes from the Gospels, right? Where where you've got it's about the the fallibility of witnesses. So the Bible is this work of of literature, this work of literature that that show that shows how different people can have different slightly different interpretations and accounts mm -hmm. of the same thing that happened and it's an the bible this is why christians will call the will sometimes refer to the bible as an invitation right it's uh it's kind of like it's something to draw you in and, and get you off thinking about people about literature about how everything works rather than a here's how to live here's what to do do it or die <laughs> you know uh so um uh, did that that it, you know the 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 quran was supposedly given directly to Muhammad, and it's the final, perfect, and unalterable word of God. Except it's more complicated than that, because actually, you know, it didn't come from Allah. It came via the angel Gabriel in the in the Islamic tradition. So it's a, that's already one, and we all know how Chinese whispers works, right? So that's already one mediating layer. That's already a, a, a point, a problem that they have, because it could be final, perfect, and unalterable, but it's hearsay. <laughs> but, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, you know, because, and, and in every tradition, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, Satan, Iblis, exists in Islam too, which means that angels are capable of defying the will of God, which means that Muhammad had no idea whether Gabriel was telling him the Quran as God actually wanted it. Uh, you know, and, and it, you know, to say nothing of the fact that large chunks of it are plagiarized from the Old Testament, as Christopher Hitchens used to love to point out. Um, so there's all kinds of problems when you make these huge claims mm -hmm. for your religious texts. And, and the, right. the Christians typically, on the whole, Especially Catholics don't do that so much because it's stupid. Right. Uh, Unless you're super <laughs> fundamental, like like Chick Fil A, obviously got in trouble because they have some anti, some homophobic beliefs, positions, I whatever. I don't think they have homophobic positions. I think that they donated to yeah like, traditional marriage or whatever. But I, I share their view. I don't think that. I mean, I'm I'm quote unquote married. It's a state marriage. So that's where I'm do, trying to lead to. I don't really think the state should have any role in marriage whatsoever. I think it's a holy sacrament, a religious institution, mm -hmm. and I am under no illusions that. My marriage is a, is a sacrament in the eyes of God. And if if churches were the only people performing marriages, I would not be married and I would not seek a marriage. But since we live in a society where I can get tax breaks, damn right, I'm going to do it. Right, right, right. I, I understand that I, I, it's not a holy sacrament. I mean, I we live in the real world. Why not take the, if there's not much of a stigma and you get tax breaks, if the only people mad at you are super fundamental. Like, so why is it that I, you I, I think I think that God will be perfectly fine with me seeking to reduce my exposure to tax given how yeah. given how tax no i do really i mean I know that sounds i'm stupid, listening too. given given how taxes are spent you know funding lesbian dance troops and welfare and illegal immigration and you know or it, given the given the given the and and planned parenthood you know given where taxes go i think god would be quite happy with me legally reducing my exposure to tax as much as possible uh so maybe I, the I, jewish I, god i don't know about this well, the Christian, I think the Christian God would give me a, I mean, he wouldn't give me necessarily a pass on the sodomy, but he might well give me a pass Asad. on avoiding paying, uh, oh, excuse me, on, uh, on on legally reducing my exposure to taxes that go to pay for abortions. Yeah, I think. Totally. Fine. I guess I my, what I'm trying to get to, my real question is, where do you get this belief that the Bible is inherently anti-homosexuality? Like you just said, sodomy, that's, uh, there's well, only I mean, like a couple verses, about, isn't there? Typically, people quote Leviticus. Um, right. There are a couple of verses about this, uh, and um, obviously, that well, as a Catholic, your teaching comes from the Church because the Church is the key to unlocking the Bible into your relationship with God. Right. So Protestants have a direct personal personal relationship with God that doesn't require a priest, so they can just read the Bible and pray, and that's okay. They're Christians. They have a relationship with God. They're good. To be 
to 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 get to heaven to to receive salvation in the Catholic Church, it, you know, it requires the church, right? You have to go through the church. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a there's a there's a church authority in Catholicism that teaches, you know, based on the te- based on the Bible, based on also the you know the, the church fathers and you know blah, blah, blah. there's a whole body of stuff that eventually becomes church teaching, and church teaching is this is a this is sinful. Um, but that's it though, just because it was passed on traditionally over t- like. The no, root. It's, no, no, it's because it's because you know the Bible. If it's only a couple of verses, and no, you said it, you're open to you know different interpretations, I'm just no, wondering where you it's, get. It's, so... it's not that it's not that there's two lines that have been spun out into homo that are so. No, it's it, 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 there's all kinds of reasons for this. Like you know, um, it's not the proper relation between men and women, and and what church teaching and, and, and God would want to do in, in almost all Christian traditions and most religion, most religions is um, lay out the proper relations between men and women, right? And the proper relations between men and women are uh, by and large in most religious traditions, the um, faithful, long-term cohabiting child producing fidelity mm-hmm. of a man and a woman in a, um, within a holy sacrament, within some kind of, of contract or agreement or covenant, right, with one another. Why? Because this is this is how we were created. This is what our bodies are for. This is this is how best to um, to achieve to fulfill our spiritual potential and and to to, to um, aside from all the, aside from the fact that it's also the best way to build civilizations and societies, right? It's not an accident that um, the West has accomplished what it has because it's based on Christianity, which is the religion, in my view, which most closely uh, dovetails with how to build a healthy, happy, flourishing civilization. Now, keeping homos- keeping the, the the holy sacrament of marriage, if you like, is the most sacred institution in the tradition, and it's the thing on which all of... Sorry, I keep doing this. I'm a gesticulator. I apologize for the noise to your listeners. I'm going to put that down now. Um... The, the the family is the fundamental building block block of society, not the individual. Okay. So it's important to keep that family unit looking like it ought to, right? Which requires some rules about the sorts of relations or or or, or um, unions that fall outside that pattern. I mean, it's just you know the, the, there are some rules to follow based on what God has intended for me, for for men and women, right? And I sign up to all this stuff. Okay. I agree with it. I recognize that I don't live it. And that's between me and my confessor priest. <laughs> you know, but but um, I think the problem, uh, something that frustrates me, and I know that frustrates uh, Nick Fuentes, who I was interviewing last night that we've mentioned, and a lot of, uh, a lot of young conservatives is that you've now, look, in 2015-16, I was kind of playing the gay conservative in a sort of high camp, way to rub the left's nose in identity politics saying look what you believe is clearly nuts because look at me i'm funny i'm handsome i'm gay mm-hmm. I'm blah, blah 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 but i don't agree with you this like breaks the laws of leftist physics right right so that was the point but now you've got these turning point guys who are just like i'm gay and i'm black and i'm a republican don't you want me um and they're not ironic about it they don't get what they're doing they literally they they read my performance in 2015 16 and didn't see the layers to it okay. and therefore they still can't understand why people like me so much because most people at home are much smarter and so my view on all of this is look i know what the church teaches and and and, and i know that i don't i don't match it but i want to share with other people what is clearly the best way to live possible rather than let's say as the as the right would say leaning into my degeneracy which i think a lot is the problem that a lot of people right. have with these like turning point campus speakers who are, are who are like pea-brained um, microorganisms um i mean I, I guess i get what you're saying like there's a lot of gay republicans who are still pretty left they still are progressive on the issue leftists. they're leftists compared they're to just, you they're opportunistic fags like what you're leftists. saying confirms that you are in that sense funda- you're a fundamentalist Christian. No, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm just a Christian. Fine, I don't think we don't have to use that label if you don't want to. It's a big, it's a big difference. It's important. Um, Was it? 
Yeah, I mean, is it calling somebody a fundamentalist Christian versus calling somebody a Christian is a big is it is a yes. I mean, there's a yes, it is important. right. I don't want to put the label on if it, but it just sounds well, like it seems like because it seems like what you've done is you've kind of shunted categories. You've said, well, you're a Christian if you kind of semi believe it. You're a fundamentalist Christmas if you, Christian if you actually believe it, right? Sure. Uh, so see, a Christian is somebody who goes to church twice a year. I don't think so. Right. Uh, right. So I think a Christian is somebody who actually believes it, and a well, fundamentalist Christian is a whole other thing. I think so. That they're we're not just, Christians. Then. I yeah. think we're just talking in slightly uh, uh, jilted categories. Right. We got to get the language i get what you're saying though now if you're either a christian or not i'm yeah no and i'm not desperate to to nitpick i just think it's important that we understand who we're talking about okay sounds good <laughs> but yeah i think you answered that pretty well i mean you know it's it's probably the most so and then do you think like homosexuality is like a like a psychological disease do you uh, i think obviously it has some elements of nature and nurture okay uh, yeah from a theological point of view, I guess I would sign up to, I would see it as a test and a, the correct answer to which is celibacy probably or join the priesthood. I, I mean, uh, I think that, that, that if, I, if I were living a more virtuous life maybe, and I know that I'm a, a great teacher uh, of people, I've always mentored, you know, journal, younger journalists and all the rest of it. I think that I maybe should have joined the priesthood in a more, in a, in a, in a, in a more, uh, in, in a less reprehensible life, perhaps I would have joined the priesthood or something, and and tried to 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 give myself in that way instead of instead of having a family. Um, I think that's probably a good thing for for gays to do. Uh, but um, so you admit, so basically, in your eyes, if you um, allow yourself to, you know, be in a gay relationship, that's sinning. Yeah, and I that's mean, why yeah, it's a good idea to yeah, be celibate. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so that. The, the this idea of loving the sinner but hating the sin means you know you can the guy can show up to church if you're not in a state of grace you probably shouldn't take communion but um you know you shouldn't receive uh, uh receive the eucharist uh excuse me but um uh but but you know you don't get shunned from the church or anything like that it does that happens sometimes in the south but it doesn't really happen in catholic churches because Catholic, i think mainly because catholics are catholics know they're sinners right this whole concept of original sin um and adam and stuff that, that people find so weird about the catholic church actually it's one of the best things because it, it it levels everybody out it's like everybody in here is a sinner and we're all just trying to do the right thing rather than and this is you know evelyn war said stuff like this you know uh um people go to the catholic church People join like a Protestant church because they think they're good and they go to a Catholic church because they know they're not, right? Uh, this is a fundamental difference between evangelicals and Catholics. Catholics start from a position of, I need to get better, right? Whereas there's often that kind of uh, puffed up self-righteousness from evangelicals that they share sometimes with Muslims um, of that sort of, you know, uh, that sort of impenetrable self-righteousness, which you just don't see very much from Catholics, which is why Catholic churches are such welcoming places to everybody. And, and sometimes, you know, uh, other churches are not. So but, were you, but were the you, act itself is, is, is sinful. Sure. Were you raised Catholic or did you develop yes. it on your, okay. So this was something that you didn't like rebel against your, no, but I did drifted from it for a long time when I did kind of, but then I came. I, I guess I, I I was raised Catholic. Didn't think too much about it or care too much about it. And then and then came back to it later in life as a product of thought and consideration and and life experience. Okay. Yeah. What made you come back to it? I guess just to wrap up because you've I've had you on for like over an hour. I appreciate your time. Um, okay. I do have to get to a supper. So so um Sounds yeah good. Maybe, maybe another five ten minutes and then I should probably really get quick. Um, are women as funny as men? No. Of course not. All right. No, of course not. Uh, because they don't have to be. It's you know, men are men are the men are yeah. blunder. We, we are blundering buffoons who live for the live for the the positive attention from women, right? We you know we we tell jokes because we because we're not hot or we're not tall enough or we don't have a good enough body or we don't make enough money. Uh, comedy humor is a is a is an invention of men who don't have anything else to attract uh, women. That's, uh, what Chris, right. that's what Chris Hitchens said. Uh, and he's absolutely, no, he's, but he's absolutely right about that. He wasn't the first to say it. He just you, did a nice... You remind nice me of him a lot. Like, you're the Christian version of him. Like Maybe. I mean, he's he's kind of the Christian version of him. Yeah. Um, well, the last thing he said before he died to, to, to Dawkins is, you know, oh, the, one I, the one thing I hope is that, um, is that uh, people don't lose the Catholic liturgy 
um, liturgy. Because it's so mm. beautiful. The the yeah, so the, the prayers and the you know the rest of it. Um, You're not saying he he gave up his atheism. I'm his, not saying he had okay. a deathbed conversion, but the last thing he's on record as saying is that the you know great loss to to the world would be the Catholic liturgy, okay. uh, because it's a work of great you know of immense beauty and depth and and uh, and all the rest of it. He wouldn't. Have, I don't think he stretched himself to say truth, but um, but no, I mean you know. Deathbed conversions are not a not a cliche for nothing. Um, gotcha, but, gotcha. but but you know, I, yeah. So I, I I wish he hadn't written that book because he was so brilliant and so so incredible in so many ways. And that you know, what, God so is you great. respect him. You actually, you of actually course, like that's good. Yeah, I don't know. No, so we read, agree on that. Like, uh, you read uh, unacknowledged legislation, which is a collection of his of his uh, writings on all kinds of literary and, and political. Topics. It's just incredible. I mean, the guy's amazing. Um, I just wish he hadn't written that book. And in fact, also his book on Mother Teresa is is cheap and weak. Um, and and uh, okay. and fu- and full of errors too so um i he, i think i think great intellects often have a sort of blind spot for something i think everybody does actually all of, of us we have this there's the, the, some some of us more than one subject uh we have a, a subject uh, sometimes it's a person too you know there's a person or a thing or a place where and, and it's just our rationality gets suspended around that topic and gets replaced with emotion replaced with something else and at his very very trying his hardest i don't think hitch ever achieved the kind of rhetorical or literary accomplishments and and greatness of his writings on authors or on politics he was never as good a writer about religion as he was about other things because i think it was not coming from the bit of his brain that everybody loved him for and you know i just wish he hadn't consumed the last years of his life uh on that i wish he hadn't i wish he isn't it's it's his worst right. book I objectively see. speaking even yeah, if he I is were, known for a lot of other things like as we if said I were yeah atheist, if, if i were an atheist i would still i would still say it is it is by far his worst book okay well you're uh, a reader i'm not i mean i maybe i mean i appreciate all you're saying i think we had a good conversation like everything that we talked about just opened up another pathway so it was very organic i think effortless yeah effortless. it was good so i i mean thanks again for doing it. i think it's a good place to wrap it up because i gotta go to the bathroom i've been drinking the whole time the coffee. what are you drinking what is it i'm drinking high life what is high life <laughs> is that a beer it's oh, by it's miller. miller yeah you're drinking beer and coffee dude what time is it it's, oh, it's um, <laughs> doesn't matter, dude. Doesn't matter. No, I, I'm such a night owl. I just woke. I texted you to Me ask too. you. Me too. I woke up at like three a uh, three p.m. <laughs> like two or three p.m. today. Hey, and that's, I that's, that's I'm the same way. So so for me it's breakfast time. So I'm watch, sitting you watching you um, watching you drink beer and just uh, at five p.m. and just thinking. It's a showbiz. I mean, it's for the podcast to get you know get work out the nerves. Do you, do you feel that it uh, also conveys a sense of gritty authenticity? N- well, yes. I'm really an alcoholic, <laughs> so yes. <It's> no <laughs> yeah, lying just, about that. Just a dude, a dude with a beer. Just with a beer. Chat, just bros. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think of when I look at you. <laughs> good. I'm glad I'm authentic to you. That's a good compliment and a good way to to end. And I would love to have you back on because it seems like it didn't take. It went by pretty fast. So we could probably get even much more. more for us to talk about. Well, maybe Hell we'll do yeah. it next time I'm in Chicago. Are you actually coming here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming for a furry conference in a minute. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, I come back to Chicago a few times a year. Let me know. We'll hang out. Sounds fun. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks, Milo. Cheers, man. Bye-bye. Cheers. All right, friends. That was Milo Yiannopoulos. That was a good call. We talked for like an hour and a half. And um, I just have to go to the bathroom. So and um, so I think it's a good place to wrap up the show. Uh, no callers. Uh, enough people commented about what they thought. That was enough. This will go up on uh, as a podcast and uh, on YouTube. So uh, it was a success, and I'm slurring my words, mostly because I have to pee, not because I'm hammered. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. The Sergeant at Arms will restore.